So uh, I always like to thank Dr. Mike Sachs. So he's the one that actually introduced me to, to teaching. And teaching is one of those things that I always wanted to do eventually, someday, maybe when life got you know not as busy and things like that. But uh, I think it was 2016, maybe, he invited uh, myself and my, my, uh, my business partner, Dr. Hamilton, out to do a lecture to the pedo clinic. And uh, then after that, he invited me back again. And then after that, um, they're like, hey, do you just want to come teach? And so that was kind of how all that started uh, back in the day. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Jeremy Manuelli. I'm an orthodontist, uh, dental facial orthopedist. I always like to throw that in there because people forget about that. And most of what we talk about is going to be uh, really more dental facial orthopedics than it is orthodontics because we're going to be focusing on phase one. But I did dental school here at UNLV and then went to LSU for residency. Uh, this is my family, so uh, my wife and I uh, have been married for 20 years. Um, when we're not doing orthodontics, uh, we love to travel, and one of my passions also, this is uh, Bora Bora, which is a pretty cool place. I'd never been there before. This, this picture is not photoshopped at all, like that's actually how it looks when you just take a picture with your phone, which is pretty incredible. And uh, one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to do is, and one of the things I'm passionate about is scuba diving, but uh, behind me there is a manta ray. And if you've never seen manta rays, it's just incredible how huge they are. And they, they call them the gentle giants. So literally this thing like swimming like right over our heads, 12 foot wingspan, and they have those little cleaner fish. I, I don't know how you like work your way up in the fish world to be like the manta ray cleaner fish, but that guy did it somehow. So pretty impressive, but lots of fun. This is my favorite photo that describes kind of our partnership because, you know, Dr. Hamilton, I, he, you know, I was an established doc, had a lot of experience, and I came in with a lot of energy and uh, ambition, and so it, it's, been a good, uh, it's been a good combination. Okay, so before we talk too much about what we do in orthodontics, specifically phase one orthodontics, I want to talk to you a little bit about why we do what we do um, so that you can start thinking about why you do what you're going to be doing and why you do what you do now. Because if you can answer that question, that's going to help you make the right decisions for you in your career. And if you don't answer that question, you're probably just going to bounce back and forth and maybe land somewhere that you want to be or maybe land somewhere that you don't want to be. So this was a study that was done a long time ago, and it was kind of interesting what they, what they did. is They took a group of students who were getting ready to go to their next school year, right? So they're getting new teachers. And they took these students and they told the teachers, hey, you know, this half of the class are the ones that are struggling and this half of the class are the ones that are not struggling. They're doing well. And, uh, but what they did is, is they actually told the teacher the opposite thing of what was actually happening. So the students that were struggling, the teachers thought were the ones that were not struggling and vice versa. And they just let that play out for a year just to see like, would it make any difference what the teachers believed about those students in their performance throughout the year? And not in every case, but to a significant degree, uh, that's what happened. The students that the teacher thought were doing well ended up doing better. And the ones that they thought were uh, not doing so well ended up doing not as well to a certain degree. And so they, they coined the term the Pygmalion effect. If you've ever heard that, that's where that came from. So we have an opportunity in the lives of the patients that we work with to make a difference, especially with kids, because all of us in this room most likely are going to be seeing kids. I mean, orthodontists, I guess you don't have to, but uh, you know, you probably will. So our thing is we change your smile, you change the world. And so you know, really we want our patients to think about the difference they're going to make. You know, a smile does change people's worlds, right? There's a lot of unfair advantages that people with nice smiles get everywhere from, you know, who you end up marrying to what kind of jobs you get to how fast you get promoted, totally unfair. But uh, we have the opportunity to give these patients uh, an unfair advantage in the world. And we want them to think about that and think, well, how can I give back to the world? What can I do with the things that I have? Not only my smile, but everything that they're blessed with. And so we ask them that question, you know, what are you doing to change the world? And, and we give them a shirt and on the back of it, uh, we have a word and that word is personal to them. So they pick it, something that they're doing, something that they want to do to make a difference. And, uh, and then we get that word put on their shirt to hopefully raise some awareness for something that's important to them. And then when a, a few years back, what we did in addition to this is we started a scholarship to help fund some of those ideas. So basically they'll submit their ideas on what they want to do, and then we'll look through those, and each year we'll grant some scholarships, not, not only to help them with their school, so a portion of it goes to them, uh, but a portion of it goes to their cause as well. So the applications are online. Anybody can apply. And it's really cool what these, uh, what these patients have come up with. So Katie, her uh, cousin had cancer, and so she started making these bracelets and selling them. 
and she raised uh, seven thousand over seven thousand uh, dollars that she ended up donating to St. Jude Hospital. And Callie was more into music, and so she uh, took her winnings and she sent some of it down to um, the Landfill Harmonic, which is a group down in South America. Their town is right on a landfill. And so they have access to trash, but not a lot else. So they would make instruments out of trash, and they have like a YouTube channel and stuff like that now. So she was able to help fund them a little bit, which was really cool. And uh, Nigel's one of my favorites. So he started a, a nonprofit that's still in operation today uh, called Clothes for Kids. And so what he did is, you know, their family fostered um, a, a child. And when the child arrived, uh, they didn't really have much of anything. Like the clothes had holes in them. The shoes were worn out. Like, they, you know, they're really like starting this new journey with this new family, and that's how they arrive. And, and he was just thinking to himself, how would I feel if I arrived, you know, at a place like that, a new start, a new beginning? So he, he started his charity to get new clothes, new shoes, new gear, new everything for kids of all ages, from infants to 18 years old. And now he has a whole house basically full of, of, of uh, merchandise that's donated from, you know, Aces jerseys to, you know, things like that, and, and then clothes from um, different stores. Uh, you know, if they go on clearance, they'll, they'll donate them to this cause. And so he'll outfit, he'll give people like a backpack basically with everything they'll need to start their new journey whenever they go to a, a new house um, in the foster care. So, okay, first question of the day for all of you, when should a child see an orthodontist and why? Okay, so so six. Who agrees? I mean, I agree with six. I think six is fine. But what is that? What does the AAO say about it? Unless it changed, and I didn't know. <laughs> What's that? Anybody? Nobody knows. We don't talk about this. What's that? When? Yeah. At what age should a child see an orthodontist if they haven't already? Someone said it. Seven. Yeah. So the seven. But but the real question is is why seven? Is that just an arbitrary number? Like why seven? Okay, first permanent molars and probably first permanent incisors will be out by that time. And what do those two teeth tell you? Okay, they tell you a lot about the jaws, right? So the central incisors and the molars typically tell you a lot about the jaws. Now, granted, these guidelines have been around for forever before the advent of imaging, right? So now we can get a lot of the information that we used to rely more on with, um, with looking at the patient when they're seven or two-dimensional imaging when they were seven. Now we can get that information earlier, like when they're six, five, even four. And, uh, but when we look at the established protocols, basically we want to see the patient at the first recognition of an orthodontic problem, but no later than seven, okay? Because at seven years old, there's a lot that you can do with the jaws that you can't do as well at even 10 years old, or 11, or 12, or 13, or 14, or 15, right? The older we get, the harder it is to move the jaws. And when we're talking about phase one, primarily the majority of things that we're going to talk about are going to be related to the jaws, not the teeth, right? Most teeth-only problems can be corrected later. Most teeth-only problems, okay? So most of the problems that we're looking at correcting earlier have more to do with the jaws, okay? So let's go, through, uh, let's go through together a few cases, and we're going to see if we can start picking out some of the challenges that we might face in these younger patients, and how we might deal with them, how we might think about them, and how we might manage them. So when we look at this patient here, what do you see? Okay, we see a narrow arch. Now, what, what are you, what, on these images, what specifically are you looking at that tells you that this is a narrow arch? So this, this image, whoop, let's see, this image down here? Okay, so you can kind of see everything in the back looks collapsed in. Okay, what else, what else do you see? What's that? Okay, so the shape of the arch up here, you can kind of see it, it you know, collapsed in at the area of the, in her, in her case, primary first and second molars and canines there. Okay, what's that? Okay, so you can see the high palatal vault here as well. Any other images uh, hint at uh, a narrow upper jaw? Okay. Okay, yeah, you can see these buccal corridors here are pretty wide. All right, well, let's keep diagnosing. So narrow jaw, we've got that, all right? So narrow jaw is, is, a, is a characteristic, right? It's a way we describe something. Um, 
It's not necessarily uh, a problem, I guess, so to speak, meaning that like a narrow jaw alone in the absence of nothing else doesn't necessarily um, cause a problem. Would you agree? Like but there's, there might be something else associated with that. So let's talk about those things that are associated with narrow jaw that we see now and things that might potentially cause problems. So what else do you see? Let's keep diagnosing this case. And Okay, anterior end-to-end -end relationship, right? So which means that the teeth are hitting on the edges of one another, right? So what does that mean from a long-term standpoint? When you hear, you know, edge-to-edge -edge bite, what are you worried about? Okay, trauma, attrition, and wear. Exactly. So you know that when we say an edge-to-edge -edge bite. Parents don't know that. So when you're talking to a parent about an edge-to-edge -edge bite, you're going to want to talk about the consequences or the things that may happen if that's left untreated. So if we don't treat this patient now, there's a chance that that edge-to-edge -edge bite may cause trauma or wear on the teeth. And so if they happen to come in later and they haven't had anything done, well, now we can still straighten the teeth, but we can't really go back and put on all the, back, the tooth structure if it was chipped or worn or broken down. So now at that point, we're working from a less than ideal result, okay? So what else do you see as far as the diagnosis goes in this case? Anything else? Okay, you see crowding. Now, crowding is a term we're familiar with, right? It looks like this. You know, there's teeth overlapping, things like that. But there's three things that I want you to associate with crowding. Well, there's really four, but there's three main ones from an orthodontic perspective. The fourth one's more of like, you know, dental health perspective. But what three things do we associate with crowding, meaning what three main problems can happen with crowding that's not addressed? Okay, that's the fourth one. Yep, so perio issues, right? So if the teeth are crowded, it's hard to keep the teeth clean. Uh, you can easily miss areas, cause inflammation, periodontal issues, things like that for sure, okay? So let's talk, there's three more kind of orthodontic things that we think about whenever we talk about crowding that we wanna to try to avoid. Any ideas what they might be? Okay, impaction of teeth, right? So if there's crowding, I haven't showed you an x-ray yet, but if there's crowding, you're more likely to have impaction of teeth. Now which teeth are the most, most likely teeth to impact? Canines, specifically maxillary mandibular. Maxillary canines, right? Okay. And do they typically impact on the palate or the, or, or the, or the facial most often? What's that? Uh, I believe it's on the palatal. You can double check me if you want, but I believe that more of the impactions happen on the palatal than the facial. So, uh, but you do have a lot of ectopic eruption on the facial, but as far as impaction not being able to come in at all, typically that's going to happen more on the palate. Okay. So tooth impaction. Great. All right. What's another one? What's another consequence? Okay, root resorption, right? When teeth are erupting or moving around, right, they can run into other roots of permanent teeth and they can cause permanent damage to those teeth. Now, if that happens in a severe case, which thankfully is not super common, but we'll go through cases where it has happened, then now you're dealing with a compromised result. Either, you know, if you're able to correct it at some point, get the canines out of the way, maybe you can keep the teeth that have root resorption on them, or maybe that root resorption is so severe that they lose permanent teeth. And now you're kind of scrambling to figure out how I'm going to get a teeth and bite to fit together with the loss of one or more permanent teeth, okay? And what is the last one? All right, severe crowding, um, and I'll, I'll, yep, extraction of permanent teeth, okay? Like, if you don't resolve crowding early enough, the crowding becomes so severe um, that there's not enough room for the teeth that they have within their arch, and they have to extract permanent teeth. Now, kind of historically, orthodontists are known for that, right? Anytime there was any crowding, oh, we can just extract teeth, extract teeth, extract teeth. And, you know, there's been a ton of literature done on extracting teeth. And, and you know, basically, if you look at the research, there's, there's uh, the general orthodontic consensus is that extracting teeth is fine, right? Um, but the reason that I, meaning that they can't prove it causes sleep apnea, they can't prove it causes uh, TMJ, although all of us see patients where that happens. But if you look at the, you know, the systematic reviews and the bl uh, controlled blind trials, uh, basically, there's not a consensus or an agreement that extracting teeth causes these problems, even though we know they're correlated, if that makes sense. But the reason that I'm not a huge fan of extracting teeth is because usually when there's crowding, it's not just tooth crowding, it's jaw crowding, right? One of the jaws or both of the jaws may be undersized. And most commonly, the maxilla is undersized. And so if you camouflage that undersized upper jaw, then yes, you can get the teeth to fit together by extracting, serial extraction, whatever you want to do, but you're going to be compensating the teeth. And there are studies that show that compensated teeth, meaning teeth that are tipped out on the upper typically or that are tipped in on the lower, 
are not as stable and you do have more dental problems throughout your life. So just from a dental health standpoint long term, I would argue that it's going to be better to get the jaw the right width. Now, the research that's currently emerging also talks about the correlation and the connection between the upper jaw and the overall health of the patient, specifically as it relates to airway health and breathing, which to me makes a lot of sense. Now, 3D imaging hasn't been around forever, and, and the more studies that are published with 3D imaging that talk about this, the more convinced I am that there is a definite correlation between airway health and expansion of the jaws. But it'll be years before that's proven to a level where it's accepted by everybody, okay? But even from an aesthetic standpoint, if we could extract teeth on this case and we could get them all to fit, but as you guys pointed out, the arch is not wide, the buccal corridors are large, so her smile is going to look significantly different if we extract teeth than if we expand the upper jaw, okay? And this is gonna be a decision that each of you are gonna to have to make. So when we look here at this image, talking about those consequences that might happen from crowding, which ones are you most worried about and why? Okay, what about the upper left three? Okay, so you're noticing the angulation of the canine, right? The tip of the canine is close to the root of the lateral. Now you mentioned, go ahead. Did you guys all know that? That's a great observation. All right, you, you, get, you get an award for having a great observation. This is usually something that, uh, that uh, I have to point out to people, but that's actually a really good point. If you haven't studied Panos, that's actually, it's a Nevada goldback. It's actually, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's pure gold. Yeah. yeah, just a little bit, but you know, yeah. So anyway, but he's correct, right? So, and this is important because, you know, depending on where you practice, I would, if you guys just start up, just invest in a comb beam. You will, you will never regret it, okay? Like a comb beam is like a free education that you never got in dental school or you at least didn't get as much of in dental school. Um, so if you have the option to practice with a comb beam, 100% practice with a comb beam. But if you don't, then you're gonna need to know a lot about the information you can gather from the 2D images that you have. So one of those things he mentioned is magnification error, right? So when you see teeth on one side that are larger than the other side or on one tooth that's larger than the other tooth, so maybe it's just the canines, in this case, it's kind of that whole left side, which, as he indicated, is probably a positional error where the patient was twisted, and that side was closer to the sensor, meaning closer to the palate. But magnification is something that, if you don't understand, it can make things look worse than they are. It can make things look better than they are. So in this case, we know that as the image was taken, it looks like the left side was magnified. So basically, all that tells us is, as a whole, we just need to know that these teeth are larger. Now, the relationship between the teeth should remain pretty much the same although we may have more overlap here than we would on the other side, which was not twisted, basically, okay? But either way, when we're looking at the canine, we can see that the tip has not crossed over the lateral, which is a good point, because if the canine tip crosses over the lateral, specifically, if it crosses over halfway, then there's a very, very high chance of either root resorption or eptopic, eptopic eruption or um, impaction, okay? Now, talking about impaction, talking about palatal canines or facial canines, which one of these, and, and ignoring the magnification error, right? So we saw that the magnification error was, was on both sides, or, or basically the whole entire side. It wasn't just that canine. So we know that canine's going to be bigger because it's on the side that's bigger. But looking just at the angulation of the canines, which canine would you say is more palatal and why? Pointing. I can't tell which one you're pointing at. So you would say the left, the left side of the screen, or the left side, left side of the patient, or the left side of the screen? Uh, left side. Okay, so why would you say that the left side of the pa uh, this patient's left canine is more palatal? You're right. Intuition. <laughs> Intuition, what's that? Well, the, the, the bigger in this case is, that, yeah, it, it, let's say that all the other teeth were not magnified and it was just that canine that was bigger, then yes, you'd be right. But in this case, that whole side is magnified. So there's something else. Some other feature. Angulation. angulation of the canine. So talk to me about angulation of the canine. So which, if the canine is more angled or more upright, which one means it's more palatal, angled or upright? Mm -hmm. Yep, so the more angled the canine is, typically the more palatally positioned it's going to be. 
and the more upright the canine is, the more facially positioned it's going to be. So most likely, if I had to guess, you know, this one's more palatal, this one's probably close to the middle, but if not, you know, more palatal, okay? So anything else that jumps out at you on this x-ray that you would be worried about or that you would want to talk to a parent about? So it, impacted canines, definitely a possibility, right? That's a conversation you're going to have. Root resorption, definitely a possibility. At a minimum, you're going to want to advise them that it could happen. But let's just stick with root resorption for one more quick second. If you had to guess the probability of this case specifically having root resorption, would you say low, low risk, medium risk, or high risk? All right, let's do a, let's do a vote where everybody actually answers. Okay, so, okay, and close your eyes so you don't get peer pressured out on this, okay? All right, all right, here, here we go. So close your eyes. I want you to raise your hand if you think this is low risk case, okay? Raise your hand if you think it's low risk case. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hand if you think this is a moderate risk case. Okay, put your hands down and raise your hand if you think this is a high risk case. Okay, all right, you can, okay. So the majority of you were, were moderate risk and there, and there was about an equal number of you, three or four that were low, three or four that were high, okay? So this means this is a good thing to talk about, okay? So when we think about root resorption, what's causing root resorption? Why does it happen? Okay, who would agree that the canine's a tooth, right? So the tooth pressing into the, the other root, which is part of a tooth, who agrees that that's what's causing root resorption? One, two, three, four. Okay, so then for the 20 of you that don't agree with her, all right, tell me why you don't agree with his statement that the canine touching the other root is what causes the resorption. Okay, inflammation of what? Okay, we have a follicle, right? So we have a follicle surrounding the tooth, and what is the follicle's job? Exactly, it's to resorb stuff to get it out of the way so that the tooth can come in. Now, when everything works perfectly, it resorbs bone and not root structure, right? So when you're worried about risks for resorption, one of the things you want to look at is the follicle, right? Have you ever seen x-rays or panos where follicles are ginormous? It's like, oh my gosh, like the tooth's like this big and the follicle's like twice as big around it, okay? You're going to be more worried about resorption in cases like that than you would in cases like this that don't have as large of follicles, okay? So what else about root resorption, uh, like indicators on the image? So let me ask it this way. Would you be more worried about root resorption if those canines were still higher up and in that position? Or would you be more worried about root resorption if the canines were further down in that position? Higher up, right? And why are we more worried about root resorption if it's higher up? What is it closer to? The apex of the tooth. What's happening at the apex of the tooth? There's development, right? So you have basically this ball of cells that's like kill everything, get everything out of the way, and then you have this other ball of cells that's like, oh, let's build some stuff here. And if those get crossed, oftentimes the kill everything cells will win, okay? And then all of a sudden the follicle takes over the formation of the tooth and you have root resorption. And then it thinks it's doing the right thing because ideally these permanent teeth are supposed to hit the root tips of teeth. It's just supposed to be baby teeth right? So once they hit that root tip of the baby tooth, it's like, man, I got my, I got my number. Here I am. Like, I'm ready to go. Like, I'm, I'm going to come in now, right? Because I found my baby tooth. Well, if it finds a permanent tooth because it's closer to the apex of that root, then that's a problem, right? You're going to see much more severe root resorption happen when the teeth are erupted. So in this case, you can see that the tip of the canine is at least past the first third of the root on both sides. So I would agree with those who said this is a lower risk for root resorption. Certainly a lower risk for severe root resorption. Okay, you know, you might, there is, there are circumstances where you'll see, like, you know, just the side of a root have a little bit of resorption, but typically it's not a huge problem, right? So if it's past that apex, um, it's very, very uncommon, especially when it's a third the way past the apex, to actually take out the whole top third of that root, all right? Let's go to the Ceph here. So we don't have this Ceph traced, but just kind of looking at things, all right? What, what do you notice about the Ceph? What stands out to you in a good way, bad way? We already talked about the edge-to-edge -edge bite here, right? So we talked about the consequences of that. But just sort of the growth overall, position of the jaws, what are you guys noticing? Okay, so she has some lip strain. So what does lip strain tell us? What, what, what might that mean with lip strain? 
Okay, open bite tendency, all right? And so is this a skeletal open bite tendency or a dental open bite tendency or both? Both? I agree. Why both? Okay, so the, yeah, the anteriors are proclined, but the, uh, the anteriors can be proclined in a deep bite relationship too, right? You could have the front teeth flared out in, the, in, a, in a super deep bite. So what's that? Hyperdivergent, let's go, oopsie, hang on. Let's go back here. So hyperdivergent what? Of the jaw? Yeah. So you have an increased mandibular plane angle, right? So skeletally, that's telling us that this patient's going to be more open. And then when we look at the occlusal plane, we see a steeper occlusal plane, right? Normal occlusal plane, about 7 degrees. Now, what's interesting with this case specifically, well, actually, let me just ask you. So let's, let's ignore the lower jaw for a minute, and let's just talk about the upper jaw. From a vertical stand, we, we mentioned that this patient is, is hyperdivergent, right? She has a, a longer lower face. But when we look at the maxilla itself, would you say that the maxilla is, is long as well, like, 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 a, like a hypertrophic maxilla? Or would you say that it's short? Or would you say that it's just right? And, and what are you using to analyze that or to tell me that? Yes. So the lip at rest should be about two to three millimeters, right? Now, to your point, she's pursing her lips here. So where is it? I don't know. You have to have another photo. But we did have some other photos, all right? So when we look at this photo, what does it look like as far as it relates to the vertical position of the maxilla? Does it look excessive or insufficient or just about right? or What's that? Yeah, hard. it's actually a hard question, right? Because in the front, it looks deficient, but in the back, it looks fine, right? So when it levels out, it, it'll probably be OK. But it's definitely not as hyperdivergent as the, the lower third of the face is, OK? And so when we look here, ideally, we want things to level out. We want those teeth to come down. We want to make room for the canines. And at the end of the day, we want to give her a smile that fills her face, right? And if you measured these jaws out on a comb beam, you would see that the upper jaw is smaller than the lower jaw. So what kind of a treatment option might you think about for this patient? Any ideas? We're not going to treat her? And tell her all this stuff and be like, all right, now go. Yeah. OK, we're going to expand, right? All right? All right, so the expansion is going to give us room in the top jaw. What else? What other changes will expansion do to the top jaw? How else will it change it dimensionally? It'll bring it downward and forward, OK, to some degree. The more you expand, the more downward and forward it's going to come. All right? So does the downward forward movement of the maxilla help us in this case? In some ways, it does, right? Definitely from the edge to edge standpoint, it helps us, right? So the further down the maxilla, or the further forward the maxilla comes, um, the more less likely they are to have that edge to edge bite with the lower teeth. Um, the width is going to help us, right? Just from the smile in general. And the downward movement, we'll see, right? I mean, it's hard to tell where her lip at rest was, but from looking at the amount of teeth she shows here, it should help us from an aesthetic standpoint. So in this case, we did maxillary expansion. We did braces on the front six teeth just to get those teeth out of occlusion in the short term. And then we followed up with a retainer afterwards. And this is after her phase one care. So this is what her teeth look like. Again, you can see a little bit of movement downward forward, not an edge to edge bite anymore. And this is where we fast forward four years when all the rest of the teeth came in. Now, did she wear her retainer? Great, no. Um, and so we had that lateral on the right side drop back into more of an edge to edge relationship. But at this point, she's ready for phase two. You can see the change in the dimension of her upper arch. You can see the change in the buccal corridors. And you can definitely see the changes in the amount of room there were for the teeth. They were able to erupt and come in. And so at this point, you can see this is where we started from a CEF standpoint. All right, this is where she is now. So she had some forward growth of both jaws, which is good. You can see a more, you know, a normal, pretty normal. We mentioned that the nasal label angle is fairly acute. I mean, it looks fairly um, normal, I would say, about 90 degrees from here. And at this point, you turned a case that could have potentially been very difficult with a lot of risk, uh, possibly bringing in impacted canines and things like that, into a fairly straightforward and simple braces or clear aligners case, you know, your choice. She opted for braces, about 16 months total treatment time, and that was the result that she got. Now, had those teeth worn down, had those canines impacted, had any of those things happened earlier, we would have been working off of a compromised result. 
And that's not our decision to make, right? And parents, if they understand the risks that they face doing one thing versus the other, then that's a decision that they're gonna make. And you'll find this. You'll find some parents will understand what's going on in a, in a patient like this, and they'll choose to wait and monitor. You know, we'll see what happens. And other patients will understand the risks and, and or the, the benefits, and they'll say, hey, this is what I want for my child. I want things to be as ideal as possible. I want the risks to be as low as possible. So our job is not to convince them one way or the other. It's just to let them know what we see and what we foresee being the consequences of doing something versus not doing something, okay? So let's look at our next case here. All right, we haven't looked at any imaging yet, but you're looking at teeth, right? So this is your, you know, your, 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 your new patient that came in for an emergency and you know, they just needed something, but then you're looking at the teeth and you're like, hey, well, maybe there's some other things I could talk to the patient about and the parent about just by looking at their teeth. So when you look at these teeth, Let's start diagnosing this case, all right? When you look at these images, I should say, when you look at everything, let's start diagnosing this case. Like, what are you seeing? What's standing out to you? What story are these teeth telling you? Okay, the laterals bother you, all right? So why do the laterals bother you? Okay, so you don't like the fact that they're, from this image, right, that they're just like so rotated and, and, and like kind of like straight toward you, okay? All right, I don't like it either. I like everything straight, but but something else bothers me more than that about the laterals. Go ahead. So, what angle do teeth normally erupt in? What's the normal eruption angle of a tooth? Pretty straight up and down, right? So, if that angle is not normal, it begs the question: Why? Why isn't that angle normal? And to his point. When we're looking at laterals, if the laterals are kicked over like this, what's the most likely cause of that? Yeah, not enough room for a canine. Now, let's just say you had his identical twin brother, and jaws are exactly the same, but his laterals are straight up and down when they came in. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, most likely? For, for the brother. Not good for the brother, right? Because if the jaw's that small and there's no room for the teeth and the laterals didn't compensate or move over or get out of the way, that means that when you look at that x-ray, the canines are probably going to be right on top of them, right? Maybe a severe root resorption situation, okay? So the fact that we see those laterals angled tells us that, hey, you know, maybe the canines are okay, or at least hopefully the canines are okay, because that would mean they'd have to be way, way over there to cause the damage, okay? We also have crowding in this case, and for a quick refresher, what are the three things that we talk about with crowding? What are the three things we want to look for orthodontically that we always want to be aware of, pay attention to, talk to parents about? Okay, impaction of teeth, root resorption, and possibly pulling teeth later, yes, okay? So let's look at this panel here. All right, so we were correct, right? The canines are there where we thought they would be. There's not enough room for them to come in. You can see that the laterals have tipped over, and from a root resorption standpoint, are we looking good, bad, in the middle? Yeah, a little bit more in the middle. We can see, you know, we know where the follicle of these teeth are. We can see that depending on how big that follicle is, it is still up toward the apex of that forming tooth, right? So this is going to be a higher risk for resorption than that previous case, okay? So in a case like this, what are we thinking about? What do we want to do? 50 years ago, the universal answer would have been serial extraction, right? Extract the primary first molars, then extract the, uh, the permanent first premolars, maybe you extract the primary canines at the same time, basically get the, the, the first premolar in, extract that, and then get the canine in. Now, can you manage this dentally doing that? Sure can, did it forever, still, some people still do it, right? One of the benefits of doing it that way is it's pretty cheap. Right? Most insurances are going to cover extractions, all right, if they're orthodontically indicated. And so that might be free to the patient. That might get them out of a situation that could be a lot worse, right? But is it ideal? Is it, if it was your kid, would you do that? Okay. I wouldn't either, right? So when we think about ideal, well, the reason these canines are impacted, the reason these teeth are having so much trouble coming in, yes, admittedly, his teeth are a little big, right? But really, his upper jaw is small. And if his upper jaw were wider, we would most likely have room for those teeth. So we have these canines that are highly likely to impact. <coughs> this is a case we <coughs> did maxillary expansion on. 
Now what's interesting is after the expansion is done, you'll notice that the relationship of the teeth is different in the back. Do you see how the upper teeth almost don't even fit with the lower teeth anymore? Okay. And the reason for that is his whole life, those teeth had been compensating. So the upper teeth had been tipping outward, the lower teeth had been tipping inward. And so when we expand and make the jaw right, the upper teeth are still tipped outward, specifically because the expanders that we use are attached to the teeth. So if anything, that tips them out even further while we're getting the jaw wider. So in many cases, depending on the amount of expansion that we need, we're going to be talking about using something to upright those lower molars, whether it's a lingual holding arch, whether it's partial braces, or maybe it's just like a Kaplan hook with a cross elastic, something to upright those lower molars which will allow us to upright those, and when we finish, we'll be able to get even more expansion in cases that need it, okay? So this is just expansion alone. You can see that just by making more room, the laterals are coming down more. They're still angulated, but they are coming down more. And we fast forward a couple years, all right? And this is where the patient is now. Still crowded, still big teeth. Could we have expanded even more? Maybe. Maybe could have done even a little bit more. But at this point, we do have enough room to align these teeth, okay? We're not out of room, and there's no severe permanent damage that can't be undone later. Also looking at his smile, again, in hindsight, maybe we would have expanded even more. If we measured this out, I would argue there's probably still a little bit of a jaw size discrepancy. Had we expanded more, we might have gotten a little bit more smile show there, okay? Things this patient's not going to have to worry about is things like this, right? We do this stuff. We work with surgeons. We expose teeth. We bring them in. It can be done. We're orthodontists. But again, sometimes when we do these things, we start to work with the less than ideal result, right? There's complications. Sometimes the teeth stop moving. Sometimes they get ankylosed. Sometimes they come in and have recession later, especially facially impacted teeth, okay? So we start off by not being able to as surely to get the best result possible. All right, let's look at one more case here. What do you see? Let's diagnose this, this patient. Okay, class three. We all know what class three means, right? What causes a class three? Okay, typically in the United States at least, a deficient maxilla, right? In some Asian populations, it's more prognathic mandible. Right? But typically in the United States, a deficient maxilla, in this case, just looking at what you see here, would you say deficient maxilla or prognathic mandible? I would agree. And what are you seeing that's telling you that? Okay, the nasolabial fold, yeah, definitely a little bit more, you know, toward the obtuse side. Okay. What else tells you that? What about the transverse? And what, what image are you looking at? Okay, so when we look at the transverse, you can see that there's posterior crossbite tendencies as well as the anterior, right? Okay, so indicative of maybe the maxilla being a little bit too narrow. What's one more thing? A little indicator, a little hint. Look at one of these pictures, maybe on the top row. What's another hint that maybe it's the maxilla? Okay, yeah, lip show, right? So what did we talk about? Ideal, you know, when you smile, ideally, you should show all of your teeth, right? On the top, maybe a little bit of the gums. So we have a vertical maxillary insufficiently, uh, insufficiency possibly. Now we don't have her lip at rest here, but looking at her smile, assuming that's her true smile, she's not showing a lot of the top teeth or not showing all the top teeth. So again, one more thing that may indicate, hey, maybe this maxilla is deficient, okay? Now, when we talk about a class three, what's important for the parent to know, all right? What does it mean? What are the consequences? What if we do nothing between now and three years from now, four years from now, what's gonna happen if we do nothing? Okay, when we, when we look at functional appliances for class two, what do we do? We, we, we move their jaw forward and hold it there, and we hope that it grows that way, right? Well, when we're looking at a class three, you know, there's probably a, a functional shift component, so we're, we're doing ex exactly the thing that we wouldn't want to do on a class three. We're holding the lower jaw forward, and there's no way or nothing that's kind of holding it back at all, right? And so if we get the upper jaw out in front of the lower jaw, well, then at least as that lower jaw is moving forward, it has, you know, the upper jaw to run into and maybe help develop that forward as well, okay? Um, so what other problems can happen if we don't do anything now, between now and the time she's older? 
between now and phase 2H, between now and like when all the permanent teeth are in? Okay, so this is one of those patients where we have the opportunity to move the bones, right? Is it ever going to get easier to move the bones than it is now? No. I mean, you know, might have been easier a year ago, right? But it's never going to get easier than it is now to move the bones, right? So if we want to move the bones, minimize the risk of needing orthognathic surgery later, then we're going to want to do that as much as we can at the, at the youngest age that we can, okay? Now, are we going to be able to move them enough that she's good forever? I don't know. We're going to move them as much as we can at this age, right? So let's look at her, Seth, here. You can kind of see if you measured out your SNA, you think that that would be a little bit more acute or a little bit more obtuse. Yeah, probably a little bit more acute, right? That you can see where the upper jaw is compared to the lower jaw. You can see that the lower jaw, at least in this image, it looks a little bit prognathic. Again, we don't have the imaging of the, the joint, so we don't know if she's posturing. You would need your, your, your intraoral exam to help you out with that. But certainly from, from the CEP, to me, it looks like maybe there's a little bit of both, a little bit of maxillary retrusion, a little bit of mandibular prognathism. And if you trace all of your CEPs, you'll be able to, to pencil that out and, and see it a little bit more. But what are you thinking about treatment-wise for this, this patient? Okay, so we expand and we protract. That's exactly what we were thinking. And in this case, because of the underbite, we were going to use some braces on the top in order to help procline those teeth a little bit to make sure that we get this patient out of an underbite. So we have maxillary expansion, we have a face mask therapy or protraction face mask, and uh, there's actually a lot of, of, of new um, technology, I guess, or products coming out for maxillary protraction. Traditional maxillary protraction, you have anchorage on the forehead and on the chin, which uh, isn't necessarily, I'm going to close that real quick just because that's uh, super noisy. Um, we have our anchorage is on our chin and on our forehead, right? Now the forehead's probably fine. There's no, you know, long-term studies. It doesn't like mess with anything. It's pretty stable. The chin, uh, you know, sometimes can be problematic because depending on the amount of force that you want to apply to the top jaw, uh, it can put too much force on the lower jaw. Patients can develop clicking, popping inflammation in the jaws. And so the, the chin isn't the best anchor. It's just the most practical anchor. So now there's two face masks currently on the market that don't uh, anchor off of the lower chin. They anchor off of either the neck or the sternum. Uh, and there's more that are coming to market. So 3D printed type helmets and things like that. But ideally, we want to be able to put force on the upper jaw to bring it forward so that the bones can move. So some type of face mask therapy and braces on the top six teeth. Okay, so this is what that looks like. You can see here that we used a bonded RPE. And the reason that we did that is we wanted to be able to open up the bite as well enough to make it easier to jump the cross bite. And you can see we used some open coil spring to help procline those upper teeth to get them on the correct side. But for those of you who aren't familiar with a protraction face mask or what it does, this is essentially how it works. So we have a device that's hooked to the teeth. The teeth are hooked to the bone via the roots of the teeth. You hook something to those that hook to the skull, and the upper jaw and the teeth come forward. Okay? And now we can actually measure in three dimensions the actual changes and effects that we get with these protraction face masks to know how successful it was both from a skeletal standpoint and from a dental standpoint. And as we go through this year, we'll go through cases where I show you these 3D superimpositions and the changes that you can see. So now here, we can see that vertically, we've had quite a bit of change, right? We can see now we're seeing all the front teeth and even a little bit of the gums there, right? So we're going to add those lateral incisors, bring those down, level that out just a little bit. And this is where she finished her phase one, okay? So we did do a little superimposition. This is a 2D superimposition, okay? So these are the changes that you can see in the bones and in the teeth. We definitely procline. Lower jaw came back a little bit, which means that she was probably uh, posturing forward in her initial images. And when we put those together, you can see exactly what happened. But, and then you can see the growth as well. But uh, when you're able to see that in 3D, it's actually a much more informative. Okay, so she had maxillary expansion and face mask for five months, braces on the teeth for six months. And when she grows up, she wanted to be a teacher, um, but she actually did grow up, and she doesn't want to be a teacher anymore. <laughs> she wants to be an engineer, but that's okay. That could change again. So what we're going to end with today, because we're, well, we might end with this. We'll see how far we can get. How much should you expand? Okay? How do you answer that question? So all of you said expansion, but how much should you expand? How much should you turn the expander? How big do you want the jaws? How do you know? What do you, what's your, do you just look at it? Like, well, how do you do this? How do you figure this out? Yeah. 
Th that's correct. So now with CBCT, we can measure the arches. But that's also correct that in the past, we would pretty much expand, like, you know, till they were in a Brody bite. And then it became kind of difficult. And so, like, we would just stop there, right? And it was kind of just a, a good estimation of how much expansion that they needed, okay? And then again, if you're doing something on the lower to upright those teeth, that means you can expand more before you hit that Brody bite, okay? But something else you need to think about when you're deciding how much to expand is how much the bones are going to move versus how much the teeth are going to move. And this is the part that becomes very um, <laughs> artistic is probably not the right word, but it becomes extremely variable, right? Because depending on the type of appliance you use, depending on the patient's bone anatomy, the teeth anatomy, how many teeth they have, how big the baby tooth roots are, there's really a lot to consider. But you want to understand the principles, right? With expansion, our goal is orthopedic expansion if we're using an expander. I don't see any other reason to use an expander than if we want orthopedic expansion because we can get dental expansion and we can get dental tipping and we can get even dental alveolar bending with much easier things than expanders. We can use braces. We can use clear aligners. We can use whatever, okay? We can move the teeth in a lot easier ways that are more comfortable for the patient. So if we're going to expand, if we're going to do an expander, we want the bones to move, okay? How much the bones are going to move are always a function of the anchorage you have and the resistance that you have, okay? So the more anchorage you have and the less resistance you have, the more the bones will move, okay? So what is our anchorage in a traditional expander like the one you saw that's connected to the teeth? What is the anchorage for orthopedic expansion? What's that? What part of the molars? What's that? Well, the, 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 the bands do go on the teeth, but what part of the, the roots, right? Your anchorage is the roots, because if you just put an expander on the crowns of the teeth and they didn't have any roots, you just, you know, they wouldn't do anything, like the jaw wouldn't move at all. So your anchorage is the roots, okay? Now, in most patients under 12 or 13 at least, that's always going to be our anchorage, right? Because usually that anchorage is sufficient to correct the jaw as much as we need to at that age, okay? Now, if the roots of the teeth that you're putting them on are baby teeth and those are almost exfoliated, that's a significantly less amount of anchorage, right? And so you have to think about that. So maybe you don't see the patient until they're eight or nine and their first primary molar is almost completely exfoliated, second primary molar has half of its roots left. That's a significant amount less of anchorage and more resistance, right? The patient's a little bit older than seven. So maybe that's not the best time to expand. Or maybe if you do expand, you look at adding anchorage in some way. So what other ways can you add anchorage besides the roots of the teeth? Okay, the palate with, with, with what? Yeah, with a Haas type expander, right? So if you do a Haas type expander, which basically has acrylic on both sides of the palate, well, now you've added some anchorage, at least to the bones, by having palatal acrylic touch that tissue as that expands. So you might consider a Haas expander, all right? What are other ways to add anchorage to the system? Okay, TADS, right? Those are the two most common ways. Now, again, it becomes a little bit tricky from a patient management standpoint. I've done TAD expanders on young kids, all right? I don't do them often, but in some instances where the orthopedic discrepancy is so large, I know there's no way that I'm going to get there with the traditional expander and the patient is having symptoms that warrant intervening at that time then I will add TADS. And TADS are great anchorage, right? When done properly, TADS are not complete anchorage, but they're almost perfect. If you do a well-designed traditional expander, Bond RPE or uh, Hyrax or, or Haas or something like that, when it's all said and done, what percentage of, of the bones is going to move versus the teeth? Like what's the best case scenario of bones moving with a traditional expander versus the teeth? So let's say you expand you know, 10 millimeters, there's a certain amount of millimeters that are going to be the teeth moving, and there's a certain amount of millimeters that are going to be, be the bone moving. So best case scenario, a, an expander designed on the teeth or teeth and palate, what's the best you're going to get percentage-wise of the bones moving? Yeah, about 50 to 60%, best case, when it's all said and done. Okay? So you expand 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, you're ending up with maybe you know five or six millimeters of orthopedic change. If that's enough, great, right? But 
you think about that, you expand 12 millimeters, you just created a, a really difficult situation with the teeth to manage, okay? So best case scenario, that's what you get, right? You're working downward from there. If your anchorage isn't as good, if they're losing baby teeth, if, you know, whatever happens, the appliance, like you're only going to get less than that. With a properly installed TAD-based expander, especially in a, in a younger child or teenager, you can get upwards of 90% skeletal change, skeletal movement, right? That's going to be stable. So now you're in a situation where the bones have moved the way you want them to move, but you don't have as many dental complications to deal with, okay? So this is how we measure it, and we'll finish off with this. So this is ideal. Upper jaw should be three to five millimeters wider than the lower jaw. Why? Because the upper teeth should be on the outside of the lower teeth, and when you have that alignment of the jaws, the upper teeth and the lower teeth can be vertical within the bone in the most stable position possible, and this is how it always used to be, right? You know, 500 years ago, any human skulls they find, but vast majority, like this is what it was. We had room for our teeth, we had room for our wisdom teeth, and then things change for whatever reason, and this isn't the, you know, we won't go into that today. But this is how it should look, okay? So, we can see here what that looks like from an ideal standpoint. So what if we see something like this? Well, now you can see that the upper jaw is quite a bit smaller than the lower jaw, to the tune of almost 10 millimeters. So is there any type of normal expander that's going to correct this? Not completely, yeah. So your options are, hey, I'm gonna correct as much as I can with the traditional expander, and then you know see what happens later, and maybe correct more with the second traditional expander after the teeth have had time to compensate or come back, or maybe look at a skeletal expander later. But this is a discrepancy that's not going to be overcome by a, a dental expander, by something that's based on the teeth. And you can see the angulation changes of these upper teeth uh, due to the jaws being smaller, okay? And, like we'll talk about more, the airway is affected. Now, I don't want you to get too excited about this image here because there's a lot that goes into volumetric airway. You know, you see this, you can't make a diagnosis, you can't say anything's wrong with the patient, but it's a warning sign. And so when we look at before and after, all right, you can see here that with this case, we got quite a bit of expansion. We at least got them to even, okay? And we can see here that as we change the size and shape of the jaws, the angulation changes, and in this case, the airway changed as well, okay? This is my son's case, pre-expansion, post-expansion. So again, we want to make sure that everything that we do is helping us to get closer to ideal, and minimizing the risk for the patients. So we'll wrap it up here for this week. Any other questions today? All right. Till next time.